So, okay, it's 9 o'clock. Um, we're going to get this going. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, we've, I've got a list of questions that have come in through the week. Uh, Alicia, our marketing person, has done a good job of putting this together, and, and thank you, Alicia, for doing that. Um, so what I want to do is go through this list of questions that I have, and, and, and they're, they're good questions. Um, some of them are kind of eye-opening um, to, to me because um, we've been doing this for a lot of years, and, and uh, it amazes me that, um, that we still have a lot of opportunity out there to, to educate people. So, um, and, and we're up for that. I, I, it's a new technology, um, and you know, the, all the all the paradigms that go along with trying to sell new technology to people. Um, what we've tried to do is um, basically educate people, and you know, base this whole business on education, and um, and less of of a sales thing than than an education thing. And one of the things I want to talk about um, as we get started here is we've started another website because. You know, when we first started, I, I was all about education in, in terms of the website. Um, and then, of course, we needed to have sales to, to keep educating. So, so the websites have kind of uh, transitioned into more of a sales and marketing thing um, and less education. So one of the things we've done to help with that is we've started a new website called SyntheticStandingRigging.com. Um, right to the point there, even though it's a long name. Um, and that and that that site is all about education about how to use this rigging and how to size for it and and what it can do for you things like that so um, please keep that in mind as we go along here um, and and get the word out that that's uh, that's where all the information is and we're going to keep doing that with that uh, website and then and then use our Clego Marine site to uh, to rely on the sales part of it so. Uh, as we go along here, I'll, I'll probably keep remind, reminding people of that website. But um, the first question is, um, will, will we offer different colors of Dyneema? And if not, why not? Um, we, when I first started, we used some, um, I don't want to name brands here, but um, we used some lashing line that was blue. And at that point, about 15 years ago, uh, the blue color was in the urethane. So it was painted on the line. And what we found out is that paint uh, and the blue dye in the paint started coming off right away and the, and the lashing line really looked old within a matter of months. So we quit doing anything that was um, other, any other color than gray, which, which is similar to the color of Dyneema. So the urethane is, is gray that goes on the Dyneema. And we've kept along with that. Now, something's changed in the industry where there's a couple of companies now, including Hampogen, that are adding color to the um, polyethylene. So on a molecular level, the the, um, the plastic is is colored, you know. So so that's a whole different story. So we are now offering lashing line that's black. Um, I don't know if we are going to do colors. We we can do custom colors right away, but um, it's probably going to be a transition before we start doing ducks, uh, the the main line that we use in different colors, just because of the inventory issues. Um, I I see us transitioning um, probably to maybe a. a offering a black and a gray. Um, other colors are an option, but again, um, we'd have to do a specific batch for that, and, uh, and that'll drive up the cost quite a bit. But it is available to people. Um, and I don't know the, the, the realm of colors right now. I do, uh, the only thing I really know is uh, we can get black. So um, as of now, that's available on a custom basis, um, not as a stock basis, with, with the exception of lashing line that we're doing in black. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, let me know if you got anything else there. Um, next question is from James Hunt. I'm going to start using line for lifelines first to get used to it. Is there a tried and true way to have an aft gate and crew pads without retensioning the rig? This is a really good question because um, one of the things I've discovered um, over the last, what I think probably five years ago, uh, was this thing called a whoopee sling that uh, I think the logging industry started it, if I'm not mistaken. But um, it's a really cool option in terms of uh, lifelines. And then with your lifelines, it's it's very difficult with synthetic lifelines to keep enough tension on, on them. And uh, as you know, uh, it's really, really important to keep tension on, especially on monohulls on their lifelines, or they don't work well. Um, but this whoopee sling is a simple way of making a gate, and, and there's a there's a chart uh, and a drawing on the on the website of how to make a whoopee sling. 
Um, and basically you're, you're taking a piece of Dyneema and running it through itself over a long distance and then coming out the other end. So it's like the berry of a splice, but it's not tapered and it comes out the other end and you put a stopper knot on it and that makes the eye adjustable. Um, and again, there's, there's a, a diagram on the website on how to do this, but to me that's essential. Um, it's an essential piece of, uh, of kit basically for lifelines uh, because it makes it easy to keep tension on lifelines. I have it on my own boat and I encourage everybody that, that gets lifeline stuff from us to do that because uh, it is a good option and, and, it's, and it's simple. So uh, take a look at that. Hope that answers your question, James. Uh, let me know if you need anything else. Question number three here uh, from Peter. Uh, I have synthetic shrouds. I have replaced them once several years ago. I find it difficult to know when it's time to replace them. They are in New Hampshire, uh, in the New Hampshire sun for about four months of the year. Um, the questions are, how can users tell when it's time to replace them? When do they start to fail? Is it obvious? Uh, is failure slow or, or catastrophic? Um, we haven't had any catastrophic failures, let me say that. Um, the, and I think it's because one of the great um, attributes of this line is that it gets fuzzy with damage with both chafe or UV. You know, so the line, if you're looking at the line at all, the line gets fuzzy and you can tell something's wrong. To me, it's like a flashing red light. Um, when, when, you're, uh, when your shroud lines start getting fuzzy, um, you know something's wrong. As sailors, we all know fuzzy rope isn't right. You know, it just doesn't compete with us. So it's, it's kind of an intuitive thing. Um, we... We've had line out there for, uh, we have boats that are still out there for 14 years now in certain places. Um, some places like Mexico, we've seen some um, some issues with line. Um, in fact, one owner down there had a problem with his backstay that broke and uh, he sent me a picture of it and you basically couldn't even tell it was it was braided line, it was, it was so fuzzy. It's something that most people wouldn't have on their boat. I immediately told them, you know, you gotta change this out and uh, and not sail your boat uh, because it looked that bad. Uh, I don't foresee most people getting to that point where uh, where the line looks that bad that they wouldn't replace it and have major concerns. Um, but that's where we're at. Now, people in the Northeast and, and, and in the Northwest and uh, Puget Sound area, they don't get a lot of sunshine. Um, we, we've had boats up there again for 14 years now is the longest one. and. Um, there's no fuzz on the line. Uh, the other side of that is I, we replaced the rigging on a, on a F-27 trimaran from Texas. The rigging was 10 years old uh, and the line looked really fuzzy. It, it was to the point where you wouldn't, most people wouldn't have that on their boat. I wouldn't have it on mine um, because of the fuzziness. It would just bother you. We pulse tested that and that, that's in our, our, some of our UV data that I'll talk about later. Um, and it pulled to about 50% of its brake strength, which is still stronger than it needed to be. You know, so um, the big thing about the fuzziness, uh, uh, you know, that, that visual indicator is there's a huge window between no fuzz and way too much fuzz in terms of time. It takes a while to get there, even in high UV dry areas. Um, so you have, you have some time to, to replace that. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers that. Um, we we are going to have uh, a uh, you know I don't I don't know what a, a pictograph if you will uh, on the website that shows you know after so many years this is what it looks like if it gets to this you should absolutely replace it type of thing so we're we're working on that right now as, as you you can tell that that uh, there's obviously some some important ways to to present that so we want to go through that slowly and make sure we're putting the good information out there. Um, thanks, Christian. I just got your message. I will, uh, I will uh, grab that on in a minute. Uh, grab your question here in a second. I've got uh, about 12 more questions to go here, and then we'll get to the ones that come in. Uh, next question is uh, from Michael. Um, looks like he's in Australia. I rigged my 11.2 meter Rogers Cat with 13 millimeter and 10 millimeter ducks and Caligo Cheeky Blocks and Terminators. I have some umbrella wraps around the six millimeter lashings, partial PVC covering, and paint on the horizontal bits on top of the cheeky blocks. I am in the North Queens and Tropics year round and would like to hear of any updates on longevity or degradation. 
Uh, I believe John quoted a test of destruction of 68% after six years in the tropics a couple of years ago. Yeah, we've updated this a lot, and I have the chart here, and I'm going to try to share this if I can figure out how to do that. Um, but basically what we're seeing is um, after 10 years, about a 60% degradation in strength um, on average. And we've pulled, I think, 44 um, shrouds now from boats all over the world uh, at varying you know, time intervals of exposure. And, uh, and that's where that number comes from. Now, it's important to remember that um, that almost always is going to result, you know, 60% decrease in strength is going to result in more strength than what the steel, uh, either it's rod or, or wire or die form, had in that same situation. Um, for instance, 9 millimeter breaks at 26,000 pounds when it's new. Um, we usually replace uh, quarter inch wire with 9 millimeter ducts, so a quarter inch wire breaks at about 8,000 pounds. Um, the 60% decrease in that 9 millimeter strength gets you down to 10,400 pounds, so you're still stronger uh, on average than, uh, than the steel was in that situation. So I don't want that to scare people, you know, 60% less in, uh, in strength is a big number, but uh, it's really important to, that it's sized correctly, and if you do that, um, you won't have any issues. And, uh, and by the time it's time to replace that, um, it, it, the, the line gets fuzzy. Virtually everything that we've gotten back, the line was fuzzy, and, uh, and it was a big indicator that it was time to change it out. So I cannot find how to share this screen, and I'm a little embarrassed by that. I don't know if anybody knows how to do that on here. Alicia? Do, do you have any idea how to do that on here? Um, in, in low of that, the information is at syntheticstandingrigging.com. Uh, so you can see the chart I'm talking about. Um, the, uh, the title of it is Predicted Dionys Ducks Life for Standing Rigging. Um, so you can look, look that up on syntheticstandingrigging.com. We'll, uh, we'll keep going on here, and, and hopefully I'll figure that out while I'm doing this. Um, number five is I have a, from Richard, I have an 8.5 meter trailer roll trimaran with carbon mass and spreaders. How do I stop chafing where Dyneema Regan goes through the spreaders? Spreaders were something that really scared me uh, when I first started this um, because of the, the constant bend and the amount of pressure, especially on monohulls that, that gets put on, on the spreader ends. Um, and whether that was going to be an extreme, you know, um, extreme, extreme stress riser in the line. Um, this has not been the case. Uh, most spreaders were able to modify um, with a Dremel tool and, and get rid of the edges. And then what we do is take uh, some, some chafe guard or just purely rigging tape, some cloth rigging tape, and wrap the line where it goes over the spreader for a couple inches above it and a couple inches below it. And it does a couple things. It stiffens up the line, protects it from any kind of edges, um, but it stiffens it up so it softens that bend a little bit and it covers it for UV. Uh, we still ask people to put boots on spreaders to cover them up, cover the, the line up there uh, in, the, in that sensitive area. But um, we haven't had any issues with spreader ends, and I've been delighted by that. Now, there's some spreader ends that you can't change, and we have, uh, we've kind of got a library now of spreader end, uh, spreader ends that we can change out and, and have a really nice radius um, with nothing to worry about. But uh, the ones we've modified uh, that I've been able to follow, I've really been impressed with how, how well uh, Dyneema has worked over the spreader end. Uh, without any problems. So that's not a big deal, even though intuitively you, th you might think it is, uh, like I did when we started, but uh, we haven't seen it as a big problem. Hope that answers your question, Richard. Uh, next one is from Will. I'm interested in the degradation of performance expected when the, the D over D ratio or shiv to thimble diameter uh, versus fiber rigging diameter is less than optimum. There are strong opinions, and there are all over the place, um, on what the bending ratio should be uh, on the, on our line terminators um, or any other thing that you're connecting. Um, 
you're connecting uh, Dyneema to. So one of the issues here, and, and one of the reasons this is controversial is racers were kind of the first ones to grab onto Dyneema uh, for, for all the reasons that everybody's grabbing onto it. Um, but one of the issues with racers is they want to keep things simple and light. Um, they're, they're very observant and they change things often on their boats. Um, I was at the start of the Ruderum, what, nine years ago now, two Ruderums ago, and I was just amazed at how much the racers were using uh, Dyneema um, on their boats. And I was amazed at how much the racers were abusing Dyneema on their boats. Um, now, the reason they can do that, they can do almost anything they want with it. It's tough stuff and it takes a lot. Um, but they, you know, after the race, they change it out. Not a big deal. We, when we first started, when I first started this company, my whole goal was to make this work for cruisers, try to get as much uh, value out of the line as possible. So I wanted to look at long-term usage, um, which really nobody else was doing. There, you know, you can tie Dyneema onto anything and pull on it a few times and it works. Uh, now, if you pull on it a thousand times at, you know, 15% of its brake strength, uh, what happens? Um, that's where we're at, trying to understand that. Um, the Hampogen, and I have a charger in front of me that I can't share with you guys, but I'm going to make sure this goes on SyntheticStandingRigging.com. Um, they, they say a bending ratio of 5 to 1, um, that is the, the, the uh, diameter of the shiv or the terminator needs to be 5 times that of the diameter of the line. Um, that's what they say you need to get about 85% of efficiency. Now, um, all of my hardware that I've designed has more than that, has upwards of 95% or more efficiency um, on all the stuff that we've tested. So, uh, and most of it is over 100%. Most of the pull testing we've done on our stuff, the line breaks elsewhere. It doesn't break where it's bent. It breaks at the splice or even in the middle of the line. You know, so I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. Um, my whole design philosophy, again, has been I don't want my hardware to cause the failure of this line. I want to get the, the longest life and the biggest value out of it. So um, that's, that's where we're at now. I think if you're going to try something else, then I think you should adhere to, to some of the companies uh, or at least the, the company of the rope that's being manufactured, their uh, requirements. And in this case, Hampogen. Uh, which has been heat stretching Dyneema uh, longer than anybody. Uh, they were uh, the first ones to start heat stretching it, which changes the properties of Dyneema too. So that's another factor in this. Uh, Dyneema, uh, when it's heat stretched, gets stiffer and tougher, and um, it's basically work hardened and, uh, and stronger. So, so that's different than regular Dyneema. If you're using regular Dyneema that's a loose braid, um, then you can probably get away with a lot more things, at least short term. But, uh, but again, all of my hardware is designed for the long term, and I don't want my hardware to be causing uh, a problem with the line, um, you know, uh, for, for lots of reasons. But uh, I, I want us to be able to give you guys the best value for this expensive line that you can. So that's why uh, most of mine, uh, most of my um, bending radii are more than five to one. There's a few that are a little bit less than that, but, uh, but not many. So, um, and, and also like a line terminator, you've got a lot of stuff you need to put in that line terminator. If it's going to be a lashing, it's got, you know, at least four lashing holes. So, so that makes it easier to make those things bigger. Um, but, um, you know, the other side of this is I think r as far as re real world usage is, is, um, that information is still coming out. You know, this five to one uh, ratio, mostly from Hampogen, is based on lab stuff. So, um, uh, you know, now we're, tr we're correlating that to, to real world usage, just like our UV data. That's correlated to real, real world usage on a sailboat. It's not lab data. UV lab data is really hard to correlate anyway, but it's not, you know, sitting, sitting out on somebody's roof for 10 years. It's, it's actually line that's being used on sailboats. So, so that's pretty valuable stuff. Um, and, and that's what's coming back to us now on, on the bending ratio um, question. So, um, yeah, to, to answer your question, maybe, you know, <laughs> as any, any engineer should answer any question, possibly maybe, but we don't know. Um, all I know is, is our hardware is designed to, to, to uh, get the best life out of the line that we can. So I would never do a one-to-one -one on anything. 
uh, even short term. So um, I hope that answers your question well. It was a little, uh, I pontificated a little bit, but um, let me know if you need any other information. Um, next question is a good question from Ryan. Um, what happens to synthetic rigging in a lightning strike to the mast? Is stainless any safer in that rare scenario? Um, good question from Ryan. Um, we've had a couple of boats get hit by lightning, and this is one of my concerns early on too. But um, the the big the big thing about lightning that I learned is if anybody knows how to handle lightning, um, I would I would run from that person as fast as possible that that said that um, because it's. Uh, Lightning is just, there's just too many variables with lightning. I did read a really good article in, in Pro Boat Magazine about 10 years ago on lightning. Um, they did a study on, on carbon mast on uh, mega yachts that had got hit by lightning because they're the tallest mast in the marina, you know, so, uh, so they get hit a lot. Uh, basically, what it said was the, the high friction areas, or I'm sorry, not high friction areas, high resistance areas. Um, are where damage is caused to a mast. Um, namely, the top of the mast where the lightning hits and then the connections as it goes down. Uh, one of our customers at a rotating mast, all carbon mast, all carbon boat, um, the lightning hit the mast, blew the Windex off it, did a little bit of damage at the top of the mast that, that was totally repairable. Um, the, the current went through the mast, down to the rotating mast ball, it basically vaporized the, the screws that held the mast ball to the boat, and then the lightning went through the carbon boat and went through out, outside the hull, the carbon hull in different places. It was sitting on an airlift at the time, um, and then that the boat had to be repaired. It wasn't a lot of damage, but uh, some of the carbon um, outer skins needed to be replaced. Um, but that mast in particular, the shrouds were connected through a slot in the mast and there was a pin inside the mast holding them. So uh, the, the lightning current actually went through the carbon right by where the shrouds are connected. So to me, that's like a worst case scenario. Um, no, no damage at all to the shrouds. Um, my philosophy on this is, is uh, or my assumption, I guess I should say, is that um, it takes heat to damage Dyneema. Um, and then, you know, what lightning happens very, very fast, and unless there's high resistance, you know, where the, where the lightning hits, and then, for instance, the, the screws that hold the, the mass ball on, uh, where you've got a lot of current, you know, thro um, basically throttling down into, into four screws, um, that, uh, so you get a lot of amperage there um, causing damage, that's, that's a high resistance area. Uh, the rest of the mast is not really a high resistance area, so there's no heat generated, you know. So, um, you know, the Dyneema didn't melt because the mast really didn't get hot, you know. And if it did, it, it happened so fast that um, the heat didn't have time to transfer into anything else. Now, most, most masts, you're going to have connectors like cheeky tangs or brackets or whatever connecting the shroud. So then that, that heat has to, there has to be enough heat for enough time for that heat to transfer through that whole system to get to the shroud to melt it. So I think it's a very, um, it, it, it's a very low probability that there will be problems with shrouds, uh, with Dyneema shrouds on boats because of those reasons. Uh, I can't say for sure because lightning is very, very unpredictable, um, but I think it's low risk. And the other boat that we saw showed kind of the same thing. That was an aluminum mast and no damage at all to the Dyneema shrouds. Um, and they had some more damage to the boat internally, electronics and things like that. Um, so I don't, I don't think this is going to be an issue, but I can't say that for sure. Um, so anyway, hopefully that answers your question, Ryan. Next question from Bruce. Uh, as an option to cheeky tangs, could there be a tubular replacement for nav tangs? Where could you insert a splice die through the mast and have a dog bone, bone or, or some other termination on the other side? Um, this is something I thought about before. Some of the mast makers are, are building this into their mast where the, the shroud goes up through the mast and then the other side they have a dog bone or something that doesn't allow it to come through the hole. Um, and we've actually done um, something similar to that, but we can do a nav tank system. It's just a matter of going through what the packaging is. Nav tanks generally have a large hole through the mast. So I think this is very doable. Um, and, and this is the kind of thing that we do. 
So, um, you know, as you can imagine, when I first started this company, I wanted to just sell my hardware. Then I realized I needed to sell the line and, and educate people on the line. And then I realized I needed to connect my hardware to the boats. You know, so there's so many different ways of doing that. So we've developed a lot of uh, a lot of solutions to issues like that. So, yeah, Bruce, uh, I look forward to talking to you about this in the future because I know the the boat you're talking about, um, and I think we can figure something out there. Um, number nine, we had a rigger friend. This is another good one. We had a rigger friend um, slash customer in New Zealand tell us there is a big difference in the length of standing rigging made from Dyneema as the temperature changes. Can this be true? And the story was that it was a big enough change to pull the chain plates out of the boat. Um, this sounds a little a little uh, exaggerated, but uh, <laughs> here, here's the deal with thermal expansion by Dyneema, because it is an issue. What's interesting is Dyneema thermally expands in the opposite direction of most things that we know. Metals expand when the temperatures get higher, Dyneema goes the opposite. So um, what you have going on, especially with aluminum mast, uh, because aluminum masts do the same thing. They expand uh, thermally, you know, only the opposite. So um, when aluminum gets warmer, it grows. And it grows about close to the same magnitude as Dyneema does, but in the other direction. So when you put Dyneema rigging on, you've got the mast growing and the Dyneema shortening. Or when it gets cold, the mast shortening and the Dyneema lengthening. Now, uh, so, so that might or might not be an issue, right? To quantify that, um, we, it's another chart that's on the SyntheticStandingRigging.com site. Um, and uh, what we've done is uh, I, I, I ran the numbers, and for a 50-foot shrouder stay uh, and a 30-degree shift in temperature degrees F or about 15 degrees C, the length of Dyneema will change about an eighth of an inch. So. Um, I can't see in any kind of circumstance ever, 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 <laughs> the, the chain plates getting pulled out of the boat uh, by this phenomena. Um, theoretically, that could possibly happen just with an aluminum mass, and it doesn't. You know, uh, the stretch of the material uh, is such, it's not, nothing stretches, you know, nothing has zero stretch. So, um, and, and you would need to have some, uh, some amount of elongation. Uh, or, or shortening to, to bring the chain plates out of the boat. And, and so anyway, that uh, I, I'm happy to dispel that rumor and that information is on the SyntheticStandingRigging.com site. Uh, question number 10, is there evidence that synthetic rigging is preferable over metal in a lightning situation? Um, from Alan, and his backup question is, do mer mermaids exist? Um, <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, I think I went over the lightning thing a little bit. I, you can say it might be pre preferable because uh, ducks doesn't conduct like shrouds do, so when, or like metal shrouds do. So metal shrouds actually give a path to the current, which could you know run current through your chain plates and and do damage to other places in your boat. So potentially, maybe it's better. Um, on the other hand, um, there there there's a slight probability that they, they could melt, like I talked about before, but I think it's, uh, it's not very probable. Um, so better is, is uh, in the eye of the beholder, I think. So anyway, question number 11. Hope that answers your question, Alan. And um, I think, you know, mermaids, the question on mermaids, it depends on how long you've been sailing and if you've been sailing with all guys or not. I think that that's kind of been proven over the years. Um, Number 11 from Al, is it possible to rig a temporary stay sail to a 15 meter performance catamaran that has a non-structural launcher on and how would you do it? Uh, it has a self-tacking blade on a furler. So, so I get questions like this all the time and we help people with the, these issues and some of them can be done and some of them can't be done. This, you know, I'll just talk about this for a minute. A lot of people, what they do for four stays, a simple four stays on catamarans are bridles off the hulls. Now, if you want to do an inner force day, maybe you could, you know, mount the, the bridle lower on the hulls and have the bridle come up um, and support an inner force day. That might be the way to do that with a non-structural launcher on. Or maybe you, you make the, the launcher on structural up to that point uh, with, a, with a, a dolphin striker or something underneath it. So there's, uh, there, there's been a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of problems like this we've solved in... 
I think um, we might be able to help you with this one. So if you can get us some details, we, we could take a look at it. Number 12, um, and I didn't write down who wrote this, but we got this other question through Facebook. Um, and it's a good question. So his question is, with an extrusion furler, can you use um, Caligo ducts, um, you know, a for, Caligo ducts forestay under, inside the extrusion furler? Um, the short answer is no, we don't do this. Um, we could, we could look at doing this and change the bearings in the furler so, so you'd have more surface area on the line and everything. But the problem is, um, for the rest of the, you know, the boat life, uh, you'd be sailing and always wonder what's going on under there and you can't inspect it. So inspectability is one of our, our major attributes and that would take that away. So uh, we do not do um, synthetic four stays uh, inside uh, extrusion furlers. We tell people, you know, leave that steel, rod or wire, diform, whatever you want to do. But um, it's just not worth uh, having something that you can't inspect that, uh, that intuitively you know is, is more chafe uh, has more chafe issues than than steel so, so it's just not a good application so that gets through all of our written questions now I want to back up here and uh, let's go through the questions Christian uh, I'm changing to synthetic in Port Townsend now on my West Cell 42 we just did another West Cell 42 um, which the uh, the customer made a point to tell me that it was much better than a West Cell 32. Um, and anyway, <laughs> I don't know. They're all they're all cool, really cool boats, in my opinion. But um, w what is the solution to use the rolling further over the synthetic rigging? So I just answered that. I think hopefully I did. Uh, let me know if you got any others. But yeah, you should use a steel four stay uh, inside that extrusion furler. Um, Nicholas, I think I answered your question too uh, about the cost, uh, the hardware and the line. Um, okay, thanks, thanks for Christian for writing me back. I'm glad you agree. Um, yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. We are working on some other furling options. Uh, we have one that uses a synthetic four stay called our ELF furler, extra light head cell furling system. Uh, although it's not really appropriate for, uh, for your boat because it doesn't reef. So for a, for a cruising boat, um, that furling system is, uh, is not really appropriate. We are working on another one though with an extrusion on it so um, that, that mounts right to the torque line. Uh, so it's all synthetic, but that's, that's probably a year out anyway. So um, anyway, I think that's all we got here. Um, sorry I couldn't share the screen with you. Alicia did get back with me, but uh, I think I'd already gotten through it. But please remember, all this information is on SyntheticStandingRigging.com also. And, uh, and pass the word to anybody you might know that that's there. We're going to try to, to uh, through social media and other means, try to get the word out that that's where that information is. My goal really is, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't care if anybody uses our stuff. Uh, because there's some, a lot of people are making their own dead eyes, you know, traditional style dead eyes, things like that. Uh, I just want to make sure people are doing it right, because there there are a number of people doing it wrong. There's still a lot of people saying you can't do this. Um, so our our idea is to get the information out there so everybody does it right. I don't want word getting out um, that uh, you know that Dyneema thermally expands so much or contract so much that it pulls your chain plates out. We, we need to get good information out so, so people have that. Um, so anyway, please, uh, please share that with whoever you think might need to use it and uh, let us know if you have any questions uh, on anything else. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate the, the, good, the kind words. So um, yeah, thanks everybody. I think we're done. Have a good day.